Hello, and welcome to this session of the Uppsala International Festival of Literature. This year, working under conditions slightly different from the ordinary, but this exception is becoming more and more ordinary by the day. Uh, my name is Yumata Murian, and I'm a translator of Arabic literature, and among other things, and I'm happy to be, be able to introduce to you uh, what I think is one of the most interesting and original writers of Arabic prose today, the Palestinian Adani Shibli. Writer of novels, short stories, uh, works for theatre, scholarly works, which are not primarily concerned with literature, but perhaps, anyway, uh, with ways of telling stories through pictures, among other things. Uh, we're glad to have you here, Adania. You're here on a screen, I hope you can see. Uh, uh, and uh, we, we meet now in the, in the only way that people seem to meet nowadays, at least here in Sweden, but we'll have to do with this via video link. Welcome also to everyone in the audience whom I cannot see at the moment. I'm looking out over rows of empty seats in the Regina Theatre, but I'm told that if I look into that camera over there, you will have the impression that I'm looking straight at you, which I am. Uh, Adenia Shibli is relatively well represented in Swedish translation. Two of her three novels are available in this uh, volume, uh, Beröring, translated by me, and Via Alla Lika Fjärran från Kärleken, translated by my wonderful colleague Anna Jonsson. There are also two short stories by Adania in uh, previous issues of the Caravan magazine. And uh, this autumn, hopefully, we will have her third novel, which I'm presently working on translated into Swedish. Uh, when this ses session was originally planned, uh, the book was scheduled for release in March, so it would have been out by now. Uh, and you were all supposed to be able to, go, be able to go out and buy a copy after this session or before this session to prepare. Uh, now, however, the, the release has been postponed to early autumn, which means we'll be discussing to a large extent, a book that most of you haven't encountered, uh, unless you've read it in Arabic or in the English translation. Uh, this book is called, in Arabic, Tafsil Thanawi, which means a secondary detail. The English translation is called Minor Detail. It will be called an Uansian Lig Detail uh, in Swedish. Uh, I can't show you the Arabic book because my copy looks like this. It's a bunch of papers. Uh, but here it is. Uh, and to comfort you, we will we'll be reading you some short extracts uh, from the book in Arabic and Swedish, just to introduce you to the main characters. Okay, Adania. <laughs> there you are. Welcome. Hello. Oh, oh I, can, I can hear you. I'm, al I'm always surprised when these technical things actually turn out to work. You're in Berlin at the moment, is that so? Yes, unfortunately. I've not been uh, able to really leave Berlin. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately. Where would you like... Or actually, maybe fortunately, because <laughs> it's good also sometimes not to travel, just to stay in one place and be able to write. Yeah, I mean, frankly, I, I, miss, uh, I miss going to Palestine. Yes. When when was the was when was the last time you were able to visit Palestine? It's already now, well, more than one year and a half ago. Oh yeah. yeah. And what does that do to you as a as a person and as someone living in the Arabic language? Well, uh, certainly it can make me more sane because <laughs> being in Palestine it can turn you insane instantly. And in terms of language, I think it's, um, it almost makes it only a language that I can live through writing. Um, and it's a privileged situation. It's like you are in this almost desert 
uh, where no Arabic is around. Although Berlin has many Arabic speakers, but um, with the social distancing, you don't really uh, hear the language in the streets uh, or experience it or feel the intimacy or the daily life through it. I think this the situation over the last two years is interestingly probably uh, shifted our relation to language. Uh, how intimate we are and how close we are to each other also sometimes it expresses itself in language. But now with us being so cautious, I wonder how this also affects our language. Is it now more cautious, more distant, more socially distant? Yeah. You're talking about the situation in Palestine right now as well? I think it's a situation now everywhere. Maybe, um, you know, uh, it's, it's unfortunately, it's for um, everyone. I'm talking about how we, how this affects our language, in fact, that I'm just thinking about it. Um, and this is something one, I don't know how to, uh, how we can imagine these influences. I mean, they influence our psyche, they influence what we see, how we see things. And I wonder how they influence our language as well, how we write. Yeah. You're able to hear your own Arabic more when there's not so many people speaking their Arabic around you, perhaps. I don't hear my Arabic. I just... <laughs> Write it, in fact. <laughs> you write so it? You yeah, write it? Writing, you yeah, write it? writing, I don't hear the words. I see them more, in fact. Uh, or, or I, I, no, in fact, I hear but segments of them. Like there are certain letters that they um, are more present or almost an echo of the words, but not really hearing them. Uh, it's very strange, you know. I, I've been always talking about this uh, peculiar presence of Arabic around me where it's where words they they appear and they manifest themselves in different ways not in the functional way we might normally use them or i might normally use them um, so they appear in a, a little bit different but i'm happy i'm happy to be in silence with language uh, with arabic language and i think this makes me even more careful uh, I think it makes me more conscious of Arabic grammar uh, in a way that if I'm in Palestine, I'm like less concentrated on that because there's also the spoken Arabic and uh, there's not much the dominance of the, uh, of the um, classical Arabic, which often one uses when writing. So now all the focus is on the classical language, uh, classical Arabic. And it makes it uh, one kind of is more careful dealing with it, more appreciating of it. Okay, before we go into this book, language is quite a natural place to start with you because when you hear other Arabic writers discussing their work, it's usually along the lines of, I want to tell this story, I want to focus on this problem, I want to discuss this issue. And when one sees interviews or hears interviews with you, you always seem to be talking about language instead, instead of stories, uh, or instead of problems or issues. Was this always your approach to writing, or were you simply at some point fed up with the way stories were told? Um. Well, in fact, I am like um, these terrible parents who always talk about their children. <laughs> Maybe that's me. I'm always <laughs> talking about um, language. I mean, probably it can annoy it's, others. It's like, perfectly okay. fine. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Um, yes, it's, I, I, I always kind of drawn to, uh, to, yeah, to the rhythm of words how they play with each other, how, what, which word can call another word. Um, it's almost like worth chasing each other in a playful way, sometimes in a heavy way, sometimes in a, in a cruel way. Um, so yeah, it is something that I've always, uh, lived with. And uh, this is what actually brought me maybe to loving language. As for uh, stories themselves, I don't know. I think 
to tell a story, one doesn't need to write. One can just tell the story. It's easier. Why one needs to spend 12 years telling a story? I can just say it and like... Not, not, three, every, not everyone spends 12 years, actually, but <laughs> <laughs> we'll, get, we'll yeah. get back to that. <laughs> yes. Okay. In my case, I, I mean, yeah, I probably need less time to tell a story than spending 12 years trying to write a story. But there's something in writing is completely different that cannot be just told. It's really, it's really about being written. And I think this is, I feel this massively. And maybe I'm also not as a good, uh, a, a good storyteller, maybe, you know, or would you would, would you like to be? Uh, I know it's too late now. <laughs> you know, as a kid, I, I, uh, I was always fascinated by hearing other people tell stories. And I always knew I cannot tell stories as good as they do. I really felt it. I really knew it. I would always have like the, the wrong start and maybe the, 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 the climax of the story. I just bring it too early. The thing, the fascinating thing with writing, you can do all these mistakes and then you can correct them. But while you are saying things you never can correct that it's it's a lost it's a it's a lost cause immediately the minute you say it and it's a uh it, it already said you cannot edit it you cannot go back and move the sentence forward or backward and uh, uh, so in that way um writing is, is is people probably who cannot tell stories because to tell a story just one and and go ahead. This is an amazing talent. It's almost like poetry, and that's why also I cannot write poetry. What 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 is it you're missing to write poetry? Because th that's not a storytelling. It's almost it's almost like storytelling without telling a story. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I think it it needs much more um, uh, precision and giving up certain things, which I'm not ready because I'm still like, I need all my noisy stuff, all my little kind of, uh, you know, like um, uh, people who, uh, who keep moving with many things and they cannot get rid of, uh, of these things, these little things, I cannot get rid of them. I need all these kind of little uh, words that they rely on other words that intersect with something else. So I cannot be without that. I, I want all the, the suffocating uh, details to be there. Details is kind of a crucial word when it comes to your writings in general. And now yes, and I felt it's a trap when I said the word. I said, yeah. oh, I should not have said yeah. that. <laughs> you, you would, I would have caught you anyway, sooner or later. Uh, uh, and now, finally, the detail has uh, even shown up in the title of the work of your latest novel, Tafsil Thanawi. Uh, this is a short novel that is falls into two parts of roughly equal size, uh, of quite different character. Uh, the first one is set in 1949 in an Israeli military camp in what is in Arabic a Naqab, and what is in the West generally known by the Hebrew term the Negev Desert in the south bordering on Egypt, uh, where a horrific crime is committed. This uh, group of soldiers under uh, the officer who is the main character of the first part of the book uh, are conducting what is pretty close to ethnic cleansing. They're uh, traveling the surroundings looking for Palestinians uh, and Egyptians, by the way, uh, and basically are out to kill those they find. Uh, they kill an entire family excepting, except for a young girl who they bring to the camp, uh, treat in rather humiliating ways. Uh, undress her in front of everyone, disinfect her with petrol, and then she's raped a series of times by different soldiers, brought out into the desert, uh, watching her own grave being dug, and then being shot while trying to escape. 
an absolutely horrific story. Uh, how do you tell a story like this and prevent it from becoming too much? I mean, you have succeeded, but there are, there, are th there are hundreds of ways in which you can tell a story like this, and you do it in quite an unusual way, I think, by not putting this... Uh, the s not putting the center of the uh, the story at the center of attention. Yeah, I mean it's strange when I, when I heard you saying all of that, I was really deeply saying this is not the book. Ah, but why? Why I, I was wondering uh, why am I saying it? Because maybe this is the an aspect that can be seen. Maybe. It, that that part is about the sounds, sounds of animals that they are heard at night and they are haunting somebody and making somebody sleepless and crazy. And then these sounds of animals and howls and, and calls, they are haunting and haunting until they get closer and they are caught and they, some of these animals are killed one of these animals survive, it has a certain relation to people, but at the end it survives. It can be this story as well, <laughs> or it can be the story of one guy who's really loves cleanness. He's so much dedicated to it. Uh, and he follows it to the to and but his task is not being successful. Though he tries and he tries and he never gives up. And he goes on and on until he collapses. So uh, for me, why I'm say saying that, because I know there is that part of what the words bring. But there's so many other parts. And the question, did I, did it, is that is the novel telling just one thing or several things? Uh, maybe in a way like wh what our language, you know, how how when we tell about something, how we of course when we say it, we we condense it in a certain way, uh, and maybe within that comes what is really necessary. Because you know, if we go on and I tell the story. Of, uh, of I say it, probably people will just be bored and, and, and uh, leave after like um, half a page of I saying it in the same way. So that's why I say it's, it's completely, that what you summarize, it can be there, but the book is not about that. The written text is not about that. I think for me, and I go back to things that I s said already before, it's really this part is a language. We can also say about the language that is made, uh, that is eliminated from the naqab, that is being hidden, being chased away. And uh, did I want to write about only that story or there were other things? Maybe there's the, the language, how it has been chased and by whom. Uh, and that's why I was always saying, for me, this novel is about the relation between two languages, the language of the of those who can commit certain acts and those who are experiencing these acts. Yeah, because the girl here is really uh, voiceless. It's almost as if the dog becomes her becomes her voice, speaks on behalf of her. And the things she's the things she's saying is no more comprehensible to the reader than what the dog is saying. Definitely, mm. and uh, we will never have access to her language. So for me, we will never. There's no way. Not only because she's remote from us, according to the novel, m many decades ago, but because. How can we imagine we have access to a language of somebody who suffers? And that's for me where also another element of, of language. Does language really 
uh, can portray our pain? I don't think so. This is like a futile uh, task. It's a, a futile demand from language. I don't think this is the task of language to, or is language is able to communicate pain. I don't think pain is something that one can communicate because it's something so much felt. And the strange thing with pain, this is something I, uh, some research has been on, as if it's almost sometimes we cannot remember it. It's a, we can speak about it, we can speak how it felt, but we cannot recall it really physically as we felt it. And, and I think maybe language is the same way. It cannot recall pain. Nothing can recall pain. So the novel is not about the girl. There's no novel that can be written about that girl. There's a novel about language that is trying to write something that is, is never and will never be able to articulate. So it is from a perspective of the officer who can articulate things. And we can hear him. And he's able to articulate things. And this is, I think, sometimes the difference between those who practice power, that they are eloquent. They can choose words. It is power to choose your words. It's power to find the exact words so calmly and so convincingly. Uh, but I wonder sometimes the powerful, when they would lose this ability, when their words, they will become somehow less convincing because it's almost you need so much uh, calm and and so much strength to communicate something if you suffer you you don't have that you really you are shaken you are um, uh, unstable you are um, uh, uh, you have so many things that come and push you that your your language is almost uh, wrinkled before it comes out and would you say that is a reason that silence is such ever ever present in your texts? A way of circling around the pain because it's it's there in the center somewhere and you can't you can't reach the center of it. So you're moving in the space of silence around it. Yeah, I'm kind of yeah. I think I'm I'm attracted by silence, but not because I cannot say things. Because it it is as it is. It's really it has um, uh, so many possibilities. My attraction to silence is is because of the so many possibilities that it holds. It's not a nothingness. It is almost everything, uh, and uh, it allows almost everything. Uh, I mean, I love words. And I trust them, but I don't trust them when they are used. I trust them when they exist. I don't trust anything that is being used or exploited for a reason. It's not to communicate. Of course, we need to communicate things, and this is fine. But I'm trying to find something around that, something additional to that, beyond communicating things. Uh, I don't know if it works. I don't know if it worked in the book. So for me, it's it's maybe it's not present directly, but it is about this uh, this uh, these uh, questions that they push language and how language can approach such such a topic. And probably if it's no, it's not about the killing of this girl that we will never have access to. I wonder which which other text would have been to to or in which situations we don't have access to language. I mean, how can you write about something that you don't have language that is language betraying? This is, this is kind of a contradiction. Uh, how, I don't know, almost like uh, how you can uh, uh, turn off fire by fire uh, or how you can save somebody from fire by fire. Language is not on her side, and language is not on the side of anyone who is uh, uh, betrayed by language. And many people who are oppressed, who are colonized, who are eliminated from our language, who we use our lang language to speak about rather than speak with, uh, those we don't hear their language, those we reject their language from our street and with a pretext of 
um, uh, one language in, in a place, like everybody should speak one language in one country, in one nation state. There's so much denials, there's so much betrayal of language. So how we can, uh, which type of language can come to these, those who are being eliminated? Uh, and the examples are not only in the, um, we can take them from the context of Palestine. Uh, there's the amazing chapter by, um, uh, Saidiya Hartman, who she examined the the his not even the history because we cannot speak, as she says about history, that actually participated in eliminating the experience of Africans who have been enslaved, who have been kidnapped from the African continent and brought to America. History betrays these people. Uh, the language betrays these people by not including references to them. But so how we can go back to this language, how we can go back to writing history for, uh, when it's completely uh, uh, being taken away from them. So now we are speaking about them. And I, I, I think this speaking, taking the position to speak about somebody is a wrong position. We cannot speak on behalf of others or about others. What I, I trust is what John Berger said once, we can borrow our voice for the others. And this is different. This is almost a, an act of generosity rather than power. But even this, I don't think I, I, I was able to be generous to her because uh, this character, because I really feel I will never have access to what she felt, what this character being surrounded by 50 men when she's a teenager, whom they don't even hear her, they don't understand her language, they despise her language in a place alone. It's, it's, it, and then to experience all what she goes through and then to have that end. What language from her perspective can be there? Uh, I, I wonder, I, I wonder if we can, even claim that we can articulate her own language. Well, I'm sorry, I'm not being very optimistic in this case, but I don't think there's a reason to be optimistic. I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. <laughs> uh, okay, we'll be meeting these two protagonists. I haven't spoken that much about the second half of the book or at all. But uh, the second half of the book, would you like to introduce the main character there? No, oh, no, please you do. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a young Palestinian lady born exactly 25 years after these events in 1949, uh, which means she's roughly your age, born the same year as you. Uh, and she reads about uh, this uh, massacre in 1949, but what connects her to it, what arouses her interest, is not the actual event, but just simply the fact that it occurred exactly on 20, 25 years before the day she was born. And she becomes uh, more or less obsessed with acquiring more knowledge uh, about this case, which is a futile task. Uh, she goes about uh, calling the journalist who wrote an article about it, uh, borrowing an ID card and uh, renting a car, traveling into Israeli ter territory where she hasn't been for a long time, uh, and uh, trying to find out facts about this uh, uh, this event uh, but we'll we'll meet these two people first the officer and then the girl into short extracts would you care to read some yes in arabic and then i'll follow up in swedish Yes, in fact, these are uh, excerpts that were chosen by you. So thank you for choosing. You're making it easier <laughs> for me to uh, 
Okay, so I'm reading here from the first chapter. أيقظته حركة ما فوق خد فخذه اليسرى فتح عينيه على ظلم حالك وحر شديد في الغرفة كان جسمه ينضح عرقا هنالك كائن تحت نهاية سرواله بقليل تحرك ثانية إلى الأعلى ثم توقف واصل طنين الفراغ يملأ الفضاء يتخلله من حين إلى آخر صوت خافت لحراك الجنود الموكلين بحراسة المعسكر وصفق الريح لسقوف الخيام وعواء كلب بعيد وربما لغاء جمال Det blir lite längre på svenska Det här är alltså officeren ute i militärlägret som tillbringar sin första natt där Han vaknade av att något rörde sig upp till på vänstra benet När han slog upp ögonen var det kolsvart och stekande hett i rummet Hela kroppen dröp av svett. Det satt någon sorts varelse en bit under nederkanten på hans kalsonger. Den rörde sig upp för benet igen innan den stannade. Surrande tomhet fortsatte att fylla luften, avbruten då och då av dämpade ljud från soldaterna som hade vakttjänst i lägret. Vinden som smällde mot tälttaken, en ylande hund långt borta och kanske kameler som råmade. Efter att ha legat alldeles stilla en stund satte han sig försiktigt rakt upp. Varelsen började röra på sig igen och han stelnade till där han var och försökte titta ner på benet. Men i bäckmörkret gick det inte att se vad det var som satt där. Fast han kunde urskilja konturerna av möblerna och sakerna i rummet, träbjälkarna som takbräderna vilade på. Doft månljus sipprade in genom springorna i taket. Plötsligt dök han ner med handen mot varelsen och sopade bort den från benet. Så rusade han upp efter lyktan som stod borta på bordet och tände den. Så fort lågan reste sig från veken började han gå runt med lyktan mellan sängen och bordet. När han inte såg något som rörde sig med än skuggorna från några gruskorn på golvet som följde lyktans svepande cirklar ovanför vidgade han sökfältet till sängen. Golvet under sängen, hörnen i rummet och området borta vid dörren. Han letade runt väskan och kistan med utrustning och resten av packningen. Sen på väggarna ända upp till taket. I sängen en gång till, en vända runt skorna. Och han ruskade på kläderna som hängde på spikar på väggen. Under sängen igen och sen hela resten av golvet. Långsamt och omsorgsfullt. Inklusive alla hörn och väggarna och taket. Och allra sist sin egen skugga som fladdrade omkring runt honom från ena sidan till den andra. Utan att veta vart den var på väg. Han lugnade ner sig och ljuset och skuggorna i rummet lugnade också ner sig. När han höll upp lyktan mot benet där han började ana en lätt brännande känsla såg han två små röda prickar i ljusskenet. Det verkade som om varelsen hade varit snabbare än han och bitit honom innan han hade fått bort den. Han släckte lyktan och ställde den bredvid kistan och gick tillbaka till sängen utan att kunna somna om. Det brände värre och värre på stället där han hade blivit biten. Och när solen började gå upp kändes det som om någon hade på att slita av honom huden. Till slut steg han upp och gick bort till hörnet där sakerna stod fläckiga av ljuset från morgonsolen som listades in genom hålen i takbräderna. Han fyllde plåtbunken med vatten, tog handduken som hängde på en av spikarna och sänkte ner den i vattnet innan han vred ur den och skrubbade sig med den i ansiktet, på bröstet och ryggen och under armarna. Han satte på sig skjortan och drog upp byxorna just ovanför knäna så hejdade han sig en stund och undersökte stället på låret där han hade blivit biten. Det hade svullnat upp en aning nu runt de två prickarna som hade skiftat färg till svart och skickade stötar av smärta genom kroppen. Han drog upp byxorna den sista biten, stoppade in skjortan under linningen och knäppte igen bältet runt midjan på det ställe där man kunde se ett tydligt märke i tyget. Så sköljde han ur handduken och hängde tillbaka den på samma spik, svepte långsamt med blicken över väggarna taket och golvet och gick ut. So what is happening here? I mean th this is uh, this is a minor details, a very small thing happening and affecting him 
and the store and the course of, the, of events in a way that is not entirely clear to the reader who is biting him an actual <laughs> an, we act never an, know. A, an actual <laughs> creature or someone trying to tell him he's the r in the wrong place doing the wrong things or someone making him do bad things I mean, in, in this uh, chapter and also probably the second chapter, it was really also in, in addition to the question of language, there's also the question of nature, the question of all, everything which is non-human or more than human or beyond human. And what role can it have this non-human in our human world? I mean, how hills will watch a crime how insects will relate to somebody who tries to settle in that place what the heat can do and it's a, it's something that kind of also was there um for me but in the background of of things like in terms of what are the characters and maybe it is also related to the, the role of language because there are certain things that we can when we tell a story as if we identify they should there should be certain characters who act and certain they move although storytelling also involves a lot of these non-human uh, elements but as if sometimes they are brought in an exaggerated way or a way that they are almost human that as if suddenly we humanize the stone or the the animal so it almost becomes uh, an, an, a human in disguise of something else but for me it was also really the question if there's if a human is struggling with the uh, in this way in these conditions if uh, us as humans, we are um, our in literature. This is through language that we can uh, be there or try to yeah try to exist there with language. What what kind of these other non-human elements can do? Uh, and and for me, it is it's really they are the characters. These words, they become characters that thing which will never be named is exactly probably like the all the characters that they will not be named or uh, so we nobody knows uh, what it is and maybe if this insect started to speak it would not start to tell us its name you know this is because she was it's, it's like only if we think we are the center we think it's going to speak to us no it just bites it's functioning, it's doing what it can do in this context. It was interesting to hear you speaking about characters without names because I, I can think of hardly any other writer in Arabic or otherwise who so consciously avoids using names for your main characters. The girl in, in Masas, she's just the girl, and her sisters are the first sister and the second sister and the third sister and the brother and the mother. And the main character in uh, Kulna, Kulna Baid, Bidat al Makhtar al Hub, is nameless. And the officer in this novel is nameless, and the girl in the second part of the novel is nameless. Is this uh, consciously avoiding names, and why? Consciously, I don't know. They they just don't have names. They, <laughs> they, they don't appear with their names. Actually, in in Kuluna Bayt Bidat Al Maghdar, there's there's one character, and she has a name, and her name is Afaf, and this name, like it means purity, and I think uh, that name came to her as a curse because she's everything but not purity. Uh, I should say that, you know, for the novel I've been working on, the current one, which, uh, you know, uh, a week ago, it, it closed its third anniversary. I was like, I've been working on it since three years and I'm still in the middle and probably it will take a few more years to finish. But I'm, I'm so much kind of uh, 
intrigued by this issue of name myself that I don't know why it happens, that I want to call the novel with a name of somebody. It doesn't, this somebody doesn't necessarily in the novel, but just to give a name and then yeah, that's it. Like, let's say this, the name of a guy and that's it. So this way, if, if I, I sinned by not giving names to all the characters, I will one day give a whole novel, a whole work that I spent on many years a name. So I hope this can forgive me. <laughs> okay, we'll get over to the second excerpt and get acquainted with the main character of the second part and the kind of life she's living in present-day Palestine. Shall I read a bit of Arabic? Please, that? please. مثلا في صباح يوم آخر وكان ماطرا استيقظت من النوم متأخرا ما حال دون جلوسي إلى طاولتي أمام النافذة الكبيرة للعمل واضطررت للتوجه إلى عمل الجديد مباشرة ثم حين وصلت الموقف ونزلت من سيارة النقل العمومي قبل دوار الساعة بقليل وجدت الشارع خاليا من المارة والسيارات كما لاحظت دورية عسكرية تقف أمام بقالة البندي لكن وبما أنه لم يكن في الأمر ما هو خارق العادة وصلت مسير في الاتجاه المعاكس نحو عمل الجديد تلك سامبل en annan morgon när det var regnigt hade jag, hade jag vaknat sent och därför kunde jag inte sitta vid mitt bord framför det stora fönstret och arbeta. Jag var tvungen att bege mig raka spåret till mitt nya jobb. När jag kom fram till hållplatsen och klev av minibussen en bit före klocktornet märkte jag att gatan var tom. Inga fotgängare och inga bilar. Jag såg en militärpatrull som stod utanför El Bendis mataffär. Men eftersom det inte var något ovanligt med det så gick jag vidare åt andra hållet på väg till mitt nya jobb. När jag nådde gatan som leder till kontoret var det en man, den enda människa jag hade träffat på fram till dess, som påpekade för mig att det rådde utegångsförbud i området och att militären hade omringat ett av husen i närheten. Jag tyckte inte det var något ovanligt med den saken heller, så jag fortsatte vägen fram. Mitt på gatan utanför huvudingången till huset där mitt kontor ligger fick jag syn på två soldater. Nu när jag äntligen hade lärt mig min läxa att jag måste hålla mig lugn och samla i sådana här situationer vinkade jag åt dem och sa högt och tydligt att jag jobbade i byggnaden som de hade posterat sig framför. Då ställde sig den ena med högra knät mot marken, stödde vänstra armbågen mot andra knät och riktade gevärspipan mot mig. Jag hoppade genast in bakom ett akasiaträd till höger och tog skydd bakom de taggiga grenarna mot kulorna som ändå inte kom. Och även om hans uppförande när han siktade på mig med geväret inte precis var humant räckte det för att jag skulle begripa vad han menade. Jag var tvungen att hitta något annat sätt att ta mig till jobbet. Än så länge hade det inte hänt något som var så oväntat att jag kände mig tvungen att åka tillbaka hem. I själva verket hoppade jag lätt över staketen och över gränserna mellan husen och byggnaderna. Jag anser att det är fullt befogat att hoppa över gränser i sådana här fall. Inte sant? Och jag tog mig hela vägen till baksidan av huset där jag jobbar. Eftersom bara tre av mina kollegor hade dykt upp på kontoret den där morgonen kunde jag göra det jag skulle utan att bli störd av någon. Det flöt med andra ord på utmärkt och jag var helt koncentrerad ända tills en av de där kollegorna kom in och öppnade fönstret på mitt kontor utan att be om lov. När jag protesterade sa han att han var tvungen eftersom fönsterrutorna skulle spricka annars. Armén hade förvarnat invånarna i kvarteret om att de tänkte spränga en byggnad där tre unga män hade barrikaderat sig. Och det var precis vad som hände några minuter senare. Men min kollega hade glömt att öppna ett av fönstren i huset och den rutan sprack i samma ögonblick som byggnaden sprängdes. Ändå var följden av att han hade öppnat mitt kontorsfönster olidliga. I spåren av explosionen som verkligen hade fått hela huset att skaka bolmade det upp tjocka moln av damm och jag såg hur dammet la sig på mina papper och till och med på min hand som höll i en blyertspenna. Jag var tvungen att ta en paus från jobbet. Jag står absolut inte ut med damm och inte särskilt inte den där sorten med de där stora kornen som ger ifrån sig ett ljud som gör att man ryser när pappersarken glider mot varann eller när man lockar dra pennspetsen över dem. Inte förrän jag hade lyckats få bort vart enda sandkorn från skrivbordet kunde jag återgå till mina papper. This is not perhaps the reaction you would expect from someone 
experience a house being uh, a house exploding thanks to mil military intervention uh, she's concerned about the dust gathering on her on her desk and on her papers and the sound of sand uh, is this a way of handling traumatizing experiences to not focus on what's actually going on but focus on the part of it that you can control certainly it can be that and it also partly what access can we have to such a uh, an act if we want to be uh, almost sincere to this situation, if this affects you, in which level it affects you? It's the dust that comes in. It's in the, almost the same way, you know, when all these uh, uh, sufferings and deaths and that they just reach us from a distance as a number or as a news article that is being replaced by another the day after from different parts of the world. We cannot claim that it touches us. It can touch us. We can investigate, we can question, but often we have a certain capacity, I think, for uh, for pain. Although I don't know, I mean, are, do we have a certain capacity or are we claiming that to create a certain uh, indifference or apathy? I know it's a, it can be um, uh, almost maddening if we keep thinking about that, but then we cannot also uh, just think about that. There's so many things, there's so many things. It's almost against the logic that we can expect to experience things differently. Uh, if you live in a situation where you uh, uh, kind of constantly uh, uh, threatened that your your being is almost always uh, reminded that it can be ended any moment, what do you do in this situation? Also, when you witness that end is happening to others. Uh, and here, I'm not talking about... Uh, the sense of compassion, because here it's not about compassion, it becomes something else, it becomes something more cruel. Uh, because if compassion is, is, the, uh, is the situation you need to be so far away, so much remote, that you feel safe, that you, what you have is compassion towards others, because you are so much removed away from any, any threat, any possibility that you can be uh, destroyed. And I think this is really something that this character experience, she is not, she has no compassion. She has a relation, a relation that she does not understand and she would like to try to understand. Is it the date of the killing? Is it the crime? It's not necessarily the case. She thinks she's interested in that, but there are so many things that they push her and haunt her and uh, they don't allow her to, to just, uh, uh, be quiet because there is this relation and for me this is like this is a question also for us what kind of relation we have to any uh, any uh, how, I don't want to say the word suffering but anything that is is being threatened by the end by uh, by its discontinuity by uh, by limiting it, by stopping it, by um, pushing it, by humiliating it. What kind of position we have that? What relation? Is it a relation to the self? Are we afraid to be in that place? Or is it really a, a feeling that is beyond us thinking we are in the center of that, that we are afraid? We have a feeling because we are afraid this happens to us eventually. And I don't believe in that because this is exact, the, the exact uh, uh, kind of, uh, uh, of uh, being self-centered, but in a, in a hollow way that, you know, uh, the cent us as a center, we're just like going, I think, within a hollow center. Uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, 
maybe the dust is her own and only way to really experience and know this really happened. Because from a distance, when you hear about it, of course you hear about those who got killed, but it's a, uh, an indication that you have not been so much close. The dust is the dust of a bombing, and it is a feeling. It's not identified as a grand feeling, maybe, by those who are far away, because they expect her something else. But for her, this is the essence of the intimacy. This is the closest that she can get to death through the dust of the building. Time flies. We're approaching the end of the session, apparently, and I have like a dozen questions left. <laughs> uh, we'll have to take them some other time. But just sh in short, this book in about 120 pages took 12 years to write. Uh, that makes roughly which makes it uh, ten pages. Ten per pages year. a year, roughly half a line a day, or something like that. Uh, what? How did this come about? Uh, what was the uh, the seed that this book came out of? How did it evolve? How did it change its shape during these twelve years? And why did it take so long? Uh, well, uh, it's really, I mean, the average is my normal average. I, when I work daily uh, and very hard, I can kind of have one clean page a month. Uh, because there's a lot of deletion as well. I mean, I don't know, you know, we were speaking earlier about stories and telling stories. Maybe my inability to tell stories is so much manifest that it's uh, like, it's constantly, uh, I'm going back and going back and, 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 and changing and doing something. And I think the only moment when I, a work is finished, not because I think it's good, because only this is the moment the work tells me it doesn't want me anymore. It's almost, I don't want to be there and the work doesn't want. So there's almost no relation between us. You know, this is, this is the end. And I know this uh, with this uh, novel, it really, the relation did not end for different reasons. There was something constantly not not there and I didn't know what it is and it, so the search there was always there's always this constant search so it's not only writing it and deleting it but also kind of really trying to understand it I didn't I didn't really understand the book uh, well or how it can be and I don't think even I understand consciously how it developed or how it moved or how it came how it is it all came by by chance and coincidence, all of it, all the, the, the changes that happen. And I think this is sometimes also frightening in writing because things happen without you being conscious as a writer, as, as the person writing them, that you feel frightened because they almost they can write themselves without you. You are just like they're, um, they are using you actually. It's not like you are using words to tell a story. The words are using you that you can write them, that you can put them. This is how it feels to me. And they kept not happy. They kept not not satisfied with 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 my uh, interventions. And of course, I know that I was aware that whenever, because many friends and, and, and people around, they knew I was working. And then they are like telling me, okay, when are you going to finish? When are you going to finish? And I feel, I feel this pressure because it's, it's yeah, it's, it's sometimes for people, it's, it's mad you work in a small novel and the novel just getting smaller uh, for 12 years. And, uh, but I couldn't rush it. It really, it took until the 12th year that it kind of finished itself. And it was, I know this moment when it finished. I mean, I really, I left the room with joy because I knew it, that's it. It was waiting for this change. Uh, so there was not a seed that I am so conscious where the work started. It, it developed, it moved, it shifted, it, it brought itself within this time. And I think this time could not have been less. I cannot think of one day that could have been less because it required all these days. I just hope that it will take less for the present one. And it is probably, hopefully, maybe one year less, let's see, or a few days less, or a few hours less, but let's see. I, I, I don't want to be under this pressure of time. In fact, I am writing as long as I'm writing, I'm actually 
I, I can manage living. And that's, it's not like I am rushing for the book to finish. There's, there's the minute that I rush a book to finish, it's actually the worst thing I can offer to, to a book. Okay. Thank you so much for participating in this session. Thank uh, you. Shukran, like, yeah. And, <laughs> uh, and for those of you watching, hopefully this book won't take 12 years to translate and then it will be out in August or September this spring on Tronan Förlag. Thank you and good night.